Everyone thinks sustainability is hard, but I'm going to convince you it's easy to do. Um, if I can get this to work. Oh, which one do I press? Oh, that one. Ah. Um, but the problem is, when we look at our current position, here we are today in 2012, and our Earth share, unfortunately, is well beyond where it should be. We should use about 2.2 giga he global hectares per person, and we're up at somewhere around about, or well, plenty, far too many to even stop any sort of climate change, really. Um, but every day I, I look at the ants in my garden and I think there is the answer to sustainability. If you weighed all the ants in the world and you weighed all the people, ants weigh three times as much as all the people on the planet. And yet we never even notice them, do we? They don't mess up the planet or anything. They do everything sort of sustainably. You know, they have farms, houses, they even conduct warfare sustainably. You know, and things like that. So and actually, they, they actually make things better. So if we can be more like ants, we can really sort out what we have to do. Because ants don't even try, and they're sustainable. Um, and, you know, how many Londons do we need? Everyone's on about the Olympics. I don't know if you know how many Londons we need. I know that London itself needs 293 Londons to support itself, which is actually quite a few, and more than London's got. It's actually the productive area of Spain just to support London. So you get some idea of the scale of the problem we've got at the moment. And the interesting thing when you look at it is, is exactly what constitutes the things we need. And the amazing thing is that the things we always think are unsustainable, like transport and buildings, are actually relatively small on that chart compared to things like food. And, um, and so here are all the sustainable indices. Um, this, this is everyone's um, earth global usage, and this is our Earth share here, so you can see we're about three and a half times our Earth share. You know, it's interesting, we always look towards Scandinavia, don't we, for good ideas for sustainability, but just look at Denmark, oh dear me, they're really evil, and, and Sweden too are quite evil. You know, when you, you want to look for someone, someone who's like sustainable in Europe, you have to go to Croatia down there, we should be spending more time looking at how Croatia lives rather than Sweden, you know. And um, so, and I keep thinking of it as factor four urbanism, this idea of half as much twice sufficiently, because that sounds a lot easier than cutting everything by four, doesn't it? You know, and I suppose, and when you start looking at it, there's some interesting ideas. The sustainable city will be pet free, because do you know that pet food has a much bigger impact in London than all the cars put together? So that's quite interesting, isn't it? So, you know, and if you look, meat eating's number one, milk drinking's number three. I personally, I'm a vegetarian, I'm allergic to milk, so I drink soya milk. I haven't got any pets at all. So actually, I drove here in a Hummer. I'm more sustainable <laughs> than you. You know, and I suppose we're going to have to somehow consume less, aren't we, of everything. So we, I presume what that means is to make shops smaller. Um, we had a look at McDonald's. that They have quite small shops, don't they? So you think, but when you actually look where their stuff comes from, well, they, they have hokey, which is a sort of, your fillet of fish is made mainly of hokey, or maybe Alaskan pollock. Um, various other things, chickens come from over here, you know, that's the world, by the way, you know, and, and some chickens from over here. Um, and so when you actually say, how big is a McDonald's? Well, that is actually how big a McDonald's is. It's actually, that, so that's the McDonald's there, so a little dot there, and that's how much land you actually need to support a McDonald's, which is actually, when you look at it, if you put it on top of McDonald's, McDonald's said, can you make one of, our, one of our stores sustainable? I said, yeah, it's really easy. It just needs to be 30 kilometers high on, the, on top of, on top of the, um, the drive through This is in a site in Liverpool, on a 22 hectare site, it's 33 stories tall. So it's quite large. But you can get that on really quickly, you know. If you eat goats instead of cows, look at this massive reduction. And if you decide to become vegetarian like me and eat bean burgers, Wow, man, you can really shrink it down. And so if you, so the, so the, the vegetarian McDonald's, it's only, it's only one kilometre high, and actually only takes up three floors of a farm on that side, which is quite amazing, isn't it, really, when you look at it. Um, I think we're going to have to think big, and, and I think we're going to have to grow by chunking. This project I did for Liverpool City Council is quite interesting. We looked at generating all, they said, how can you make Liverpool sustainable without changing anything? which is quite an interesting idea. So what we did here, we, 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 did, we used glass recycling to produce algae arrays that floated in the, in the Mersey estuary, and we generated biodiesel from the algae farms, and we found that by producing algae, we, the waste product from the algae from crushing it to make fuel oil, 
was great food for cows, so we could feed all the cows around about, and the waste from that could be fed into greenhouses to produce food, and the waste from that could be fed to the algae arrays, so we get a closed cycle, and then we could use the power to heat and power the city. And actually, when you grow it by chunking, it, takes, it only took 50 years to grow something that produces double the amount of fuel and power that, that Liverpool needs within the estuary itself, so that would make Liverpool a net exporter of oil, which would be quite an interesting idea in 50 years' time. Um, you could also think small, but perfectly formed. I like the idea of that. This is a, a house where you produce everything you need within the house, so it has vegetarian... You think, oh yes, you're all going to be vegetarian here, but actually not, you know. It produces its own fuel for the car. That's a smart car, and um, it uses... It's a diesel one. Um, when you look at it, you get three pigs, 11 chickens, a bit of lawn which is quite good. You get, so you get your full diet. There's an algae array on the roof. There's a wind turbine in the back garden. You also get a, um, a pond underneath your floor here, can you see? That has tilapia in, which are very tasty fish, and they like to live on vegetable waste, so you chuck all your vegetable waste in with the fish. They, and then you can fish for them in the evening and have fresh fish, very healthy. I'm sure. I'm not allowed to eat it myself. I'm sure it's good. So you can live in an incredibly small space, and that's got zero... Usage. I, I think you know, one of the things that we don't do is make enough business opportunities out of sustainability. Um, we were looking at a project in Nelson, and everyone knows that to make somewhere sustainable, you sort of do that, don't you? You know, and you put photovoltaics on the roof, makes everyone happy. Well, what we did, we a bit had a different idea, because Nelson's a poor, sad little town with a hill outside it, with nothing really going on. What we did, we used the energy from those cells to power... Olympic ski resort. We've made a giant um, sort of inflatable sort of mountain and inside that we, we used um, all the electricity to produce um, snow so we could get 365 days a year skiing. On the hill, on Pendle Hill, we could get every Olympic event on there without any remodelling so it's quite easy. Everyone could travel by train and all the waste heat from the, from the snow power heats all the homes in Pendle so you end up getting a, a new economy for a place without by just adding photovoltaic cells. And that's what I call <coughs> synergistic urbanism, really. You know, I, I think, you know, everyone knows we should grow our own. What about furniture? We did a project with IKEA. Um, you know, they make everything out of chipboard, really, which mainly comes from, from, from basically Romania or um, Poland, places like that. Well, here, what we did, we, we um, made it out of native trees that we grew in our gardens. We got everyone, we made a point system for IKEA so you can get a certain number of points and you get the points by basically buying, by selling them cheese. They come around with a mobile chipper, chip your cheese, trees, you can grow them in your garden so you can, if you need a billy bookcase, you can take your lawn, cover it in trees, sequest a lot of carbon, you know, and, and in three years you can get a billy bookcase like this, 300 points. You can, there's plenty of spare space in the city, you could do gorilla gardening, gorilla tree planting, grow anything, grow any number of trees you like. And, and actually within Leeds, around Leeds, there's plenty of space to grow all the furniture that IKEA needs in basically a 10 mile radius. I, I love heritage, I know you do, but what about recycling someone else's buildings? New York's replacing 30% of its buildings in the next 30 years. And actually one of the interesting things, we did this project in, in Birkenhead, and Birkenhead is the model for Manhattan. They, they basically, took the grid, I don't know if you can see clearly the grid here of Birkenhead and the park, you know, they're exactly the same shape as the grid of Manhattan and the grid and the and central park. And basically, they made the float here by digging, by blasting out a lot of sandstone, which they took to New York to make the harbour and to make a lot of the original brownstones. So, and now they're, they're getting rid of the brownstones. We're, we are actually, we actually re-imported them into Birkenhead and rebuilt them. It's even got the same street um, car and subway layout, actually, which is quite interesting. And then eventually we, we, sh we worked out exactly how much there was in, in terms of the buildings. We shipped them back over and we built this fantastic view. Look what you see from Liverpool now, a whole New York circa 1950. Very nice. You know. Here you go. It's even, we even made it its own state so it could be a little bit of America on British soil, which I'm sure Americans like you would like, wouldn't you, I think? Would you enjoy that? I'm from Canada. Oh, Canada. Well, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, globalization is good for you. You know, I know that lots of people don't think so, but in areas like the Air Valley where you've got 
all this crazy stuff going on with distribution sheds and all this and agriculture and things. Actually, what you've got is everything that you need to make a city. You just need to stack it up in a cleverer way. Here, we, through a series of policy obligations, we created a, a, a sort of an, an industry and warehousing layer, a layer, and they built the roof, which you could then hide all the supermarkets in, and then the supermarkets could build this, this um, sort of public domain on the top, and everything be close by so you can recycle things quite easily. So here you go, three zones, and all the cy cycles happen in this sort of space, and it, and it starts to knit together all the nasty uh, urban infrastructure that gets in the way of Leeds. And localization too is good for you. Um, here, what we did, this is an interesting project in Salford, where we looked at Pendle, oh gosh, so pressing the wrong buttons again. Look to Pendlebury. Pendlebury had its centre, its medieval centre, murdered by a by a railway in Victorian times, and grew up with no no town centre and just mainly council houses. So we we basically collected the original town centre plan and we imported loads of listed buildings from around Salford that were in danger of collapse, and we placed them here to create a new town centre, um, which is this sort of area. This is down here, and then we floated a big photovoltaic array to power the thing and created a global office space for people to work in on top of it. You can see that, so you get this heritage landscape and the great thing about it is, you know, anyone knows Manchester, one of my friends, Gonny, once said, you know, that the only, Manchester's got everything, the only thing it hasn't got is a roof. Well, we've got this sort of, this um, LCD cloud-based roof now that stops the rain coming in, which will certainly improve things. Um, just a few more <coughs> short projects. Um, things go around in cycles. What, what I really try and do is close cycles in the city. This was a, a project for British Steel when they were going um, to recycle steel using algae arrays again. We used the algae to produce biomass that then could power the, um, around, the process of, of steel recycling and the oxygen produced by the algae array could be used in the oxygen furnaces and the carbon dioxide of that could then be put back into the algorithm way to close all the cycles. And finally, don't be efficient, be effective. This is trying to maximise the sort of things you can do by closing cycles. This is a project we did in Liverpool where we looked at growing mulberry trees and we tried to maximise the, the output you can get from a certain amount of land. By growing mulberry trees, you can grow silkworms. The silkworms, you can produce silk. You can feed the silkworms to sturgeon. Sturgeon meat is very expensive. They also produce caviar. You can then use the silk to produce lingerie, which is a very expensive use of materials. And you can use the, the waste silk to produce hair care products. And the waste grey water from that process can be used to feed the mulberry trees. So you maximise the performance. We reckon we can get at least 50 times more um, economic value out of a piece of land than a, than a car park, a typical car park in Liverpool, which is the most economic way of using land. Okay, thank you very much.